Colombia's president orders mass military deployment to the city of Cali, the epicenter of the nationwide anti-government protests. At least four people have been killed in a hospital fire in Brazil. And France acknowledges its role in the 1994 genocide in Rwanda. Hello and welcome to Telesur. I'm Jose Daniel Lopez in Quito, Ecuador, and this is From the South. Colombian President Iván Duque has ordered the mass deployment of military forces to the city of Cali to support the police in a move likely to escalate the repression against protesters. The president, accompanied by Interior Minister Daniel Palazos, traveled to Cali after the city experienced one of its most violent days since the national strike began a month ago. President Duque had ordered the deployment of 7,000 troops in addition to the National Navy and the National Police, while claiming to recognize the right to peaceful protests, Duque called to accelerate arrest warrants and stressed that what he referred as uh, vandalism would not go unpunished. He also called on the people to support security forces in their efforts and claimed that the authorities were acting to protect citizens and strategic assets of the nation. Therefore, I want to be absolutely clear in stating that as of tonight, a full deployment of military assistance to the National Police will begin in the city of Cali and in the Department of Valle. This deployment will be headed by officers of the highest experience. The person in charge of the deployment operation of military assistance in the city of Cali and in the department will be General Perez division commander who is receiving precise and specific instructions, not only mine, but also from the general command in coordination with the governor's office and the major's office in Cali. Still in Colombia, a member of the prosecutor's office was lynched after killing two people and wounding two others in Cali. According to witnesses, the incident occurred in La Luna district of Cali during demonstrations this Friday. Eyewitnesses stress that an official of the technical investigation body of the public prosecutor's office, who was not wearing a uniform, opened fire causing the death of two people and wounding two others. After the incident, local residents attacked the official, causing his death. Demonstrators also denounced that there were at least five attacks against uh, protesters on Thursday during demonstrations in Cali which has become the epicenter of anti-government movement. We want to work with dignity. Colombia we want to General to Francisco Barbosa has condemned the violence that left three people dead in Cali on Friday, while also assuring that Francisco Bermudez, who was lynched for killing two demonstrators, was not on duty at the time of the attack. The Office of the Nation regrets and expresses its solidarity with the families of the victims of the incident that occurred today in the sector of La Luna in the city of Cali. Freddy Bermudez Ortiz, who died today in these same events, was an official assigned to the technical body of investigation who, according to the information gathered so far, shot several people, causing the death of some civilians. It should be noted that this official joined the institution in 2012 and, at the time of the events, he was not in carrying out work linked to his functions as he was off duty. Likewise, Mr. Bermudez ended up dead at the hands of people who were in the area at the time of the events. The Attorney General's Office of the Nation rejects all acts of violence that threaten the lives of our citizens. As the nationwide anti-government protests in Colombia continue, young volunteers are bringing relief to those facing the violent state repression. According to the NGO Temblores, over the last Colombia, month, more than 60 people have been reported dead with security forces implicated in the killing of 43. Escudo, On May 24, Armando Álvarez, a doctor providing care to demonstrators in the city of Cali, was shot dead as he left his workplace. 
In the face of such violence, many volunteers remain anonymous as they work to attend to people hit by the police with tear gas, rubber bullets and stun grenades. The most serious cases are injuries to the face and eyes, often leading to partial blinding. I saw on the news how many people were injured every day and I felt helpless at home, watching only through a camera lens. And one day I decided to take my first aid kit and go out and start helping. We are doing what the police should have done, and that is saving lives. We are saving the lives of the people who are protesting, who are fighting for what we want. These are things that pull at your heartstrings to hear a kid say, don't let me die, or ask, tell me the truth, did I lose my eye? Will I see again? Am I blind? This is very painful, but at the same time, it is very satisfying to be able to provide that fair aid and save a life. At least four people have been killed in a hospital fire in the Brazilian city of Aracaju. A fire partially destroyed a wing of a municipal hospital intended for treatment of COVID-19 patients in Aracaju in northeast Brazil. According to local media, the list of the victims includes a 77-year-old woman. Local authorities reported that there were about 60 patients at the hospital. Causes of the incident remain unknown. The Cuban parliament has held a hearing on the need for the lifting of the U.S. blockade. During the meeting, lawmakers highlighted the effects of the devastating policy of the United States government on the country. Members of parliament also reiterated their commitment to the fight for an end to the blockade. On June 23rd, Cuba will submit a, a resolution titled of Necessity of Ending the Economic, Commercial and Financial Blockade Imposed by the U.S. Government Against Cuba to the United Nations General Assembly. Since its first uh, presentation in the 1990s, this resolution has received almost unanimous support from the international community, which has called for the immediate lifting of the blockade. However, the U.S. government maintains this policy and former President Donald Trump imposed further unilateral coercive measures. Cuban authorities have also stressed that the U.S. economic blockade has affected the manufacturing of the country's domestically developed COVID-19 vaccines and delaying their vaccination campaign. It must be said that we have not vaccinated more Cubans because we have not had the resources to make more vaccines so that the world is clear. It is not due to a lack of technical evidence. It is because we have not had the resources, because these resources have been obstructed. The blockade that affects, above all, the financial sector and that makes it difficult for us to pay many parts of the world for the products that we acquire, to pay for the services that we request, or to receive payment for the services that we give or the goods that we sell. Obtaining loans is immensely difficult due to the fact that the United States included us on this illegitimate list. More news in a minute. Stay with us. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa has stressed that Africa cannot wait for COVID-19 vaccines any longer as experts warn of a possible resurgence of COVID-19 ahead of the Southern Hemisphere's winter, which starts in June. There is, however, one thing that the African continent cannot do. We cannot continue to wait in the queue for life-saving COVID-19 vaccines. We are waiting in the queue, and we are tired of waiting in the queue. We want to be at the front of the queue, and this must happen now. We say, let us work together to have this waiver 
for a limited period. That in itself is not going to break the innovation concept and all it requires is that there should be more access. And if saving lives is important to all of us, this is not too much to ask. Indian and health authorities have reported that daily confirmed coronavirus cases were under 200,000 for the second time this week, indicating a decrease in trend. Such uh, numbers have not been recorded since mid-April, leaving behind the peak of 400,000 confirmed cases per day at the beginning of May. Friday saw the lowest increase in new infections since April, but experts warned the official figures fall short of the reality. India has reported over 27.5 million cases since the beginning of the pandemic, a figure only surpassed by the United States. The drastic drop in the number of cases contrasts with the number of deaths, which remains high at an average of 3,000 per day. As a result of the drop in, cases, in case numbers, authorities announced a gradual withdrawal of restrictions in the capital New Delhi starting Monday. As the United States and the European Union called to launch a new investigation into the origins of COVID-19, the World Health Organization has stressed that the process is full of blame and politics and asked that scientists be allowed to work free of political influence. Uh, this whole process is being poisoned by politics. Uh, and if you expect scientists to do their work, if you expect scientists to collaborate and actually get the answers that you want, actually seek uh, in a non-blame environment to find this, the origin of the virus so we may all learn how to prevent this happening in future, we would ask that this be done in a depoliticized environment where science and health is the objective. Uh, of this uh, and not blame on politics because quite frankly uh, over the last number of days we've seen more and more and more uh, discourse in the media with uh, terribly little actual news or evidence or uh, new material uh, uh, and this is this is quite disturbing quite frankly Irish Prime Minister Michael Martin has announced that the nation will reopen pubs and international travel as his vaccination campaign continues to advance. This is an important time for us all. After the trauma of the last 15 months, we are finally taking definite steps towards enjoying normal times with friends and loved ones again. So, from the 2nd of June, hotels, B&Bs, guest houses and self-catering accommodation can reopen for guests. And from the 7th of June, outdoor services and bars and restaurants can recommence. But subject to us continuing to make progress, we will move to the next phase of reopening. And this will mean that from the 5th of July, we will see the return of indoor services in restaurants and bars. Malaysia's Prime Minister has announced that the country will go into a nationwide lockdown from June 1st to June 14th. The announcement came as the country reported more than 8,000 new coronavirus cases in the last 24 hours for the fourth consecutive day. This number brings the total confirmed cases since the beginning of the pandemic to more than 500,000. During the new lockdown, only essential sectors and services will be allowed to operate. The country has continued to record uh, new heights in COVID-19 infections and deaths throughout May, despite three weeks of moderate restrictions under the movement control order. Rwandan President Paul Kagame has condemned France for finally acknowledging its role in the 1994 genocide. President Kagame described the acknowledgement as a big step, even though France has not yet apologized for contributing to the bloody conflict. French President Emmanuel Macron recognized France's role in the killing of nearly a million people during her historic visit to the East African nation this week. Kagame, who led the Tutsi rebellion that ended the genocide, has regularly accused France of complicity in the crime, but French leaders were determined not to admit it. A stage has been set where we can uh, see a better and maybe deeper relationship between uh, Rwanda and France. Um, so I think I am up a bit about it. I think it, it was it was positive. It was good that uh, it happened, and many more things are going to happen after the visit. 
we should not allow acrimony or misunderstandings uh, around or about the truth to go on forever. Uh, we must be able to be sensitive to the feelings and uh, opinions of the survivors directly, specifically, uh, and also uh, the future <laughs> that everyone has to live. An agricultural technology deal between China and Mozambique has started to bear fruits. The China-Mozambique Agricultural Cooperation Project, launched 10 years ago, has increased food security in the African nation. The mechanization program implemented in Mozambique's uh, Gaza province has improved grain production in a country that has been affected by hunger due to underdeveloped agricultural technology. Under the deal, Chinese companies deliver advanced farm, uh, farming equipment and also send experts to the southern African country to train farmers on new farming techniques. They're helping our, our country, not for people from Gaza only, but for all countries. Many people will think that uh, maybe the people from Gaza or from Mozambique, uh, they will be die from hungry. But we didn't die. We're still alive until now because we have a local production. The United Nations has welcomed the decision reached by Somalia's leaders to hold presidential and parliamentary elections within two months following five days of intense negotiations in Mogadishu. In early April, the lower house of the federal parliament adopted a special law that extends the mandate of President Mohamed Abdullahi Mohamed and the current parliament for two more years, abandoning a landmark electoral agreement reached in September 2020. Opposition to the decision led by the mobilization of militias and exposed divisions within the security forces. Led by Prime Minister Mohamed Hussein Roble, the agreement reached on Thursday concluded a summit between the federal government of Somalia and federal member states. The United Nations and other diplomatic partners have described the deal as a critical opportunity to advance peace and security in the country. We urge all stakeholders to move forward swiftly in the same spirit of compromise and cooperation to implement this agreement. We further encourage the FGS and FMS leaders to continue regular consultations throughout the electoral process to ensure any emerging disputes can be resolved quickly. It is important that updated timelines for the Upper House, House of the People, and presidential elections be issued as soon as possible. We also look forward to rapid establishment of election implementation bodies at federal and state level and full implementation of the Election Security Committee. More stories coming up after one last break. Don't go away. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad gratitude on Friday for the huge turnout in Wednesday's election in which he won 95% of the vote to secure a fourth term in office. What you have done was an unprecedented challenge to the homeland's enemies from all nationalities, loyalties and allegiances. You turned the scales, destroyed the rules of the game and you have confirmed without any doubts that the rules are made here, set and determined here by our own hands. There is no place for partners, only for our brothers and friends. 
The Palestinian Colonization and Wall Resistance Commission has denounced that Israeli officials have given the green light to build 560 units in the legal settlement of Matzat, more than 10 kilometers south of Jerusalem. In a statement to the Palestinian news agency, activist Hassan Brilejit added that the announcement came just days after Israeli authorities endorsed a plan for the construction of 90 new illegal units in the Ibi Hanal settlement. He also stated that Israel's increased settlement expansion activities are clearly aimed at forcing Palestinians from their land. All Israeli settlements are considered illegal according to the international law and the United Nations resolutions. Palestinians are calling for support from the international community to rebuild what was destroyed in the Gaza Strip following Israel's latest attacks. Before the ceasefire took hold, Israeli airstrikes fire on Gaza for 11 days, killed more than 254 Palestinians, including 66 children, and wounded almost 2,000 people, according to the health ministry in Gaza. The UN Human Rights Council decided on Thursday to establish an open-ended international investigation into violations surrounding the latest Gaza violence and into systematic abuses in the Palestinian territories and against Palestinians inside Israel. Which war are you talking about? This was not a war, but a massacre. Our generation has lived through four wars, but we have never seen anything like this one. It was not a war, but a massacre. They destroyed, dispersed and displaced us. We had airstrikes, warplanes and tankers on one side, and on the other, our children were scared and we lost our loved ones. We asked the world to stand with us and not leave us like this. Our homes were destroyed and now we live in the streets. We need home and beds to sleep in. We also need flour, as the supplies that are given to us are not enough for the people. Try to support us, as the situation is really difficult. Palestinian journalists protested this Friday against attacks on their colleagues in the East Jerusalem neighborhood of Jake Jarrah. Over the past month, as huge protests continue against the imminent expulsion of Palestinian families from the Jake Jarrah neighborhood, police assaults on journalists have increased, according to the Union of Journalists in Israel. While Israeli and international members of the press have also been attacked, Palestinian journalists have been targeted disproportionately. At least 15 journalists have been wounded by Israeli forces since the beginning of May, of whom 13 are Palestinians. Along with other restrictions imposed by Israeli authorities, press advocates stress that the attacks hamper press freedom in what has become a major flashpoint for violence surrounding Israel's occupation of Palestine. We came today to Sheikh Jarrah to protest against the recent attacks by the Israeli police against uh, journalists in Jerusalem. Since the tension started a few weeks ago in Jerusalem, we saw many attacks by the police against journalists and especially, especially Palestinian journalists in Jerusalem. These attacks include arrests, throwing stun grenades and violent acts, violent acts against uh, journalists who just came to do their jobs. We came today to say that the Israeli police and the Israeli government should allow any journalist from any nation to do their job freely and they should respect freedom of speech. The Palestinian press is targeted everywhere. With all the harshest wars in places, journalists are not attacked. Only in this country, journalists are arrested, journalists are injured, journalists are killed. This protest is directed first and foremost to the police and then to the world to see the police of the Egypt has announced it will help rebuild Gaza after the Israeli occupying army bombarded the coastal territory for 11 consecutive days. The Egyptian government will collaborate in the reconstruction of infrastructure in the Gaza Strip following the ceasefire reach on May 21st. The reconstruction will be focused on water and electricity supply networks as well as repairing roads and buildings in the Strip that were damaged after hundreds of airstrikes. The Egyptian Business Association announced that most of the companies participating in the efforts will be from the private sector but will work under state supervision while the services of local companies will also be higher. Egyptian developers will be elected based on their past experience in national mega-projects in Egypt and other Arab countries. 
This initiative will bring hope back to Gaza and become a source of employment for young people in the district because the Egyptian companies will hire Palestinian workers in the projects. It is also a good opportunity for the exchange of knowledge and experience in the fields of infrastructure and construction. In Myanmar, the armed conflict between rebels and the military junta has so far displaced 120,000 people. The figures were revealed by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. The report comes amid fighting between ethnic guerrillas and the Myanmar army following the military junta's seizure of power on February 1st of this year. The fighting has led to internal displacement and urgent need for basic necessities such as food, water and medicine. At least 831 people have lost, have lost their lives as a result of brutal repression by security forces against peaceful demonstrators, according to figures from the Association for the Assistance of Political Prisoners. And we come to the end of this news brief. You can find this and many other stories, as always, in our website at telesurenglish.net. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Jose Daniel Lopez. Thank you for watching.